In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your spirit moving in our midst. We thank you because of your word that is so clear. We thank you because of the challenge asking us where we shall be when the trumpet sounds. Lord, we pray that when, day, when that day shall really and fully come, none of us will be left behind in Jesus' name. We are praying, O oh Lord, that you speak to our hearts now, that you lead us in your truth and in your word. Prepare us, Lord, that we may be ready when you will come. In Jesus' name, we pray. Tonight, we want to consider the words of Jesus Christ, the words of the prophets of God in the Old Testament, the words of the apostles and the prophets of the New Testament concerning something solemn, something great, something that the church of Christ will of necessity have to consider. They deal with prophetic things in scripture. They deal with studies on the last things, on the last days. They deal with things that are so certain that Jesus spoke about them to his own disciples, assuring them that these things will surely, definitely come to pass. And actually what we study tonight covers a lot of ground. Each of the parts of what we study could have been expanded to be a message on its own. We're speaking on the last days, the rapture, and the great tribulation, as well as other prophetic words in scripture surrounding those three major things. In Matthew chapter 24, reading from verse 3, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famine and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And there shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another and many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many and because iniquity shall abound the love of many shall wax cold but he that shall endure to the end the same shall be saved 
These are the days described in a passage I've read to you as the beginning of sorrows foretold by our Lord Jesus Christ. Already we can see in various nations, in various parts of the world, the appearance of false Christs, false prophets. Already we hear the news, the rumors, and the devastation of wars. We read, we hear of famines and pestilence and disasters. These are so real as never before. The next great event we're expecting now is the rapture of the church. Then, after the rapture, the great tribulation, when judgment is poured out upon Christ's rejecters, and the Jews are forced to call for their Messiah, at the close of the great tribulation, after the earth will have been renovated, Jesus will set up his millennial reign, a time of peace and justice, such as has not been known since the Garden of Eden. The curse which fell when Adam transgressed the law of God will be lifted from all creation, and the world or once again enjoy Christ's righteous government. As I said, there is a lot to see, a lot to read in Scripture. And it is very important we go step by step because most preachers are not quite knowledgeable on eschatology, that is, on the study of the last events of the last days. We'll systematically go through three points. One, signs of the last days. Two, the rapture of the saints. And three, the great tribulation after the rapture. Point one, the signs of the last days. Already you can see from the passage we have read, the disciples asked the Lord, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world or the end of the age? And Jesus then gave them some signs. And these signs, as we compare scripture to scripture, we discover are the signs of the last days. And as we look at the fulfillment of these prophetic words, you will have to believe that there never was a time in the history of the world when there were so many false prophets and deceivers as today exactly as Jesus prophesied. Many churches who once preached the fundamentals of the Christian faith, like the new birth and a life without sin, have let down the standard. The last days that Jesus spoke about, the last days that Paul spoke about, the last days that John the Beloved spoke about, the last days that Peter spoke about, and the rest of the inspired writers, those last days are here with us already. Jesus spoke of the earthquakes that would mark the end of the church age. And this century, geographers have told us that this century, has witnessed more earthquakes than all the other centuries of world history combined. When you think about it, 
that if you put all the earthquakes of the whole world in church in world history together that all those occurrences of earthquakes are not as numerous as the earthquakes of this century then you know we're pretty close we're pretty near famines are another sign of the last days in spite of modern technology in spite of modern knowledge in agriculture half the population of the world today is going to bed hungry every night pestilence and diseases like cancer like heart disease like AIDS are killing millions today in fulfillment of prophecy in the Old Testament in Nahum chapter 2 Nahum very close to the end of the Old Testament chapter 2 verses 3 and 4 the shield of his mighty men is made red the valiant men are in scarlet the chariots shall be with flaming torches in the day of his preparation and the fir trees shall be terribly shaking now you see the language of this prophet talking about chariots what we today will call vehicles or automobiles or cars the prophet said these moving machines are with flaming torches if Nahum had lived today seeing the headlights of the vehicles shining so bright it would have been strange on the one hand but then he would have recollected his prophecy that those are the flaming torches then he said in verse 4 the chariots these moving vehicles shall rage in the streets they shall jostle against one against another in broad ways they shall seem like torches they shall run like lightnings at the time of this prophet there were no express roads tired roads wide roads at the time of these of this prophet there were no vehicles moving so fast like you will say that the chariot was running was running like lightnings at top level speed but then this prophet saw that at the time of the end that there will be so there will be chariots that is in the language that the people at that time could understand that these chariots or what we call cars automobiles will run so fast that in the streets remember the streets of those days were not tired roads and were very very narrow so he wasn't talking about his own time he was talking about these last days now the chariot shall rage in the streets and shall justly against one another that's talking about the accident that we notice today and the accident rate is rising by leaves and bounds as millions of vehicles or automobiles or cars throng the highways and the city streets as prophesied by Nahum there's another prophecy that concerns the last days in Daniel chapter 12 Daniel chapter 12 verse 4 but thou O Daniel shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased 
Here again, Daniel gives us one of the signs of the last days. That knowledge shall be increased. And many will run to and fro to seek knowledge. Everywhere people are on the move. You can see that in our world today. Any day, any time, you get to the local as well as national as well as international airports in the world. And you see the number of people that are traveling, going to and fro. And you see that today, the jet planes have brought the farthest distances to within 24 hours from any given place. And today, as you move around the world, you see that knowledge is increasing. Universities in the world are crowded to capacity. People are seeking for knowledge. And every new day in this world, new colleges, new universities, new polytechnics, new schools are being built. Don't you know then that the days that Daniel spoke about, those days are here already. Another sign of the nearness of the end of the church, that is the end of the church age, is the Jewish nation. In Matthew chapter 24, Matthew chapter 24, verses 32 and 33, Jesus said, Now learn a parable of the fig tree, when its branch is yet tender, and put it forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh, so likewise ye. When ye see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. During the past 50 years, more scriptures have been fulfilled concerning the Jews than in all their previous history. That statement needs to be understood. From the time of Abraham to the time of David, from the time of David to the time of the taking away into the Babylonian captivity, and from the time of the Babylonian exile, Unto the birth of Jesus Christ, three blocks of time that Matthew spoke about. And he said, From Abraham to David, 14 generations. He said, From David to the carrying away to captivity, 14 generations. And he said, From the carrying away to the Babylonian captivity to the coming of Christ, 14 generations. As you look at all that period, from Abraham to Christ. A period that spans a long time. From Genesis chapter 12 to the end of Malachi and to the first chapter in Matthew, many prophecies were fulfilled concerning the children of Israel. As we look at the time of Christ until 70 A.D., and from 70 A.D. until the few years of the first centuries of the church age. Again, many prophecies were fulfilled concerning the children of Israel. Now, look at this century alone. Within the last 50 years, more prophecies of scripture have been fulfilled concerning the children of Israel than all the prophecies fulfilled from Abraham to David to Babylonian captivity to the coming of Christ to 70 AD and to the few years just before this century. Which tells us that the time of the Gentiles is about running out. God is looking at his program, at his timetable. And he's telling us that now he wants to go back to concentrate on the Jews because the time of the Gentiles is almost over. Which means then, as you look at Israel, on May 
14, 1948, the Jews formed their, nat their first national government that they had had since before the Babylonian captivity. And as to consider the words of Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 21 and verse 24. Luke chapter 21 verse 24. It says, And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be left away captive into all nations that's talking about the Jews. He said, they shall fall by the sword. And history, recorded history, is there to tell us of the fulfillment of the words of Jesus Christ. And then it says, they shall be led away captive into all nations. And that has been fulfilled. Then it said, when they are left led away, into all nations, Jerusalem will no more be occupied by the Jews. They will be driven away from there, from Jerusalem. Then he said, And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles. Is that forever? No. Until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Which means Jerusalem will not be occupied by the Jews until the time of the end is near until the time of grace for the gentiles is running to a close until the time of the gentiles be fulfilled which is calling upon the church the lord is saying church look up church read your newspapers church listen to the current affairs church look in the direction of the middle east Church, look at Israel. Church, focus on Jerusalem. Are the strangers of Jerusalem? The Gentiles that, that trod upon Jerusalem, are they leaving Jerusalem? Are the Jews coming back to take their place, to take their land? Are, they, are the parliaments in Israel taking their stand with the United Nations saying, we're not going to strike a bargain with anyone. Jerusalem belongs to the Jews. And are the governments of the world, are they supporting Israel? Are they recognizing the autonomy and the authority of the nation of Israel? Are the Palestinians, the PLO, and all these other people, are they saying, okay, we have fought long enough. We have deprived Israel long enough. Now, let the people of Israel occupy their land. The time is near. Because Jesus said, and Jesus never missed it. He said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And he said, Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Therefore, if we read our Bibles aright, if we look at the signs in Jerusalem, in Israel, in the UN, United Nations, if we look at everything that is taking place, and we realize that now all these things, according to Scripture, they are being fulfilled, we know the time is near. We may be living in the last hours of the last days. Because the time is very near. There is no doubt we're seeing the last days. As we look at other prophecies, talking about apostasy, the falling away from the truth, we see today that even though that fulfillment of prophecy is sad and tragic, yet it is an infallible sign of the nearness of Christ's coming. On the one hand, as we look around, in the religious world, there is formalism. On the other hand, there is fanaticism. 
And this is the fulfillment of prophecy. If you look at what we have in Scripture, Second Timothy. Second Timothy, chapter 3, from verse 1. This know also that in the last days, in the last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. We see that everywhere. And it is multiplying. And you will see the aggressive nature of the restless youth against constituted authority. Authority at home, authority in society, authority in government, authority in the church. And you will see that these are the fulfillments of the prophecies concerning the last days without natural affection. Truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. As you look at the people that are addicted to drugs, and you see their look, you see their hairstyle, you see their manner of life. You see how fierce they are. And you come back to these scriptures. And you see the fulfillment on the athletes. The fulfillment on the youth. The fulfillment in the music industry. That is the music of the world. That it comes to the time. That even the athletes and the people that supervise athletics. Have to be screening the people to know which of the people are trying to gain some stimulant through the use of drugs in being able to play well, being able to run well, being able to wrestle well or do any of the athletic games that they do. And you see the effect of hard drug, the effect of all these things upon society and people are fierce. As you look at the history of today, and you see in various nations, even in African nations here, and you will see a 14-year-old child drafted into the army of some rebel groups. And you see that these children at 14, at 16, at 17, they're giving drugs to stimulate them and to make them not to care for life or care for anything and be willing to shoot at the snap of the finger. Don't you know that as you see all that? As you hear that in your news, as you see that in the newspapers, don't you know those days that we read up in the New Testament, the days are here already. We should be packing to get ready to go home. We should be expecting the Lord. Because the beginning of sorrows, the beginning of sorrows, all these things are already there. The world is ravaged with wars. The world is being devastated with calamities and evil to an indescribable proportion and so this shows us that the time of the end is here already it says traitors heady high-minded lovers of pleasures more than lovers of god remember it says those are the last 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 days lovers of pleasures more than lovers of god a football game clashes with sunday services millions of churchgoers will not go to church they'll sit at the television to watch that game if there is any event on boxing any event on wrestling any event any event on soccer on football any event on the games of this world, any event coming out of Olympics comes upon the screen, upon the television. You see the people all over the world, in the village, in the town, in the city. You see them all crowding together before the television box. They want to see that. And that shows you lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. These are the last days. Or when you see the pleasure mad throng. 
and you see the industry, the cosmetic industry, and you see the industries that raise up all the things that go for pleasure. You have the Disneyland, you have the Wonderland, you have this land, you have that land, just for recreation. And you have tourism. You have a lot of things. And you have tourism here and you create tourism, a spot there, so that the people can see a place for pleasure. It is multiplied more than in the previous centuries. These are the last days. In verse 5, having a form of godliness and denying the power thereof from such turn away. So you will see that's formalism. Having a form of godliness and yet denying the power thereof. Formalism is that form of worship that professes to know God but lacks the power of godliness. Titus says, they profess that they know God, but in words, they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and unto every good work, reprobate. Titus 1, 16. On the other hand, there is fanaticism, that form of worship that claims to be spiritual, but in actual fact, it follows a false spirit runs after divers and strange doctrines being deceived by lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish with the nearness of the end of the age both formalism and fanaticism have made tremendous inroads upon the christian world until those congregations or denominations not already infested with either the one or the other a few very few indeed with all that we see of the fulfillment of prophecies concerning the last days we know one thing the rapture can take place any moment from now because these are the last days already and I've shown you from the pages of scripture, the prophets of old, and Christ lifting up the eyes of the church, saying, look up, look far enough. When you see the end of the age, these are the signs that you will notice. And here comes Paul the apostle, again saying, look up, and look far enough. When your spiritual eyesight God catches the horizon and catches the end of this church period and this church age. These are the signs you will see. And we have seen those signs. And it tells us the end of the church age is near. The rapture can take place any moment from now. That leads us to point two. The rapture of the saints. The rapture of the saints. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 from verse 13. But I will not have you to be ignorant brethren concerning them which are asleep that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent meaning shall not proceed, shall not hinder them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then 
we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. The rapture of the true church can take place at any moment. Suddenly, without a moment's warning, in the twinkling of an eye, Jesus will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, the graves will be opened, and the dead saints will rise, and we which are alive, alive spiritually and physically, and remain, will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. The church that will be raptured is the true church, the small church in the midst of the large visible church. The church that will be raptured is the glorious church keeping himself unspotted, undefiled by the apostate backsliding church. The church that will be raptured is the church that is saved, sanctified, spotless, separate and distinct from the world. That the true church, that the living church, that the saved, sanctified, purified, spotless church, that the church that is separated from all the corruption of the denominational world, separated from all the apostasy and the false doctrine and the falling away of the apostate church, that the distinct separated church, the church that keeps to the reality of its call, the ecclesia of God called out of the world. That is the church that is going to be cut up to go with Christ. And this will happen before the great tribulation. The true church will not go through the great tribulation. The one, the safe church, sanctified, spotless, separated from the pollutions of the world, that church, the bride of Christ, will not go through the great tribulation. However, the nominal church will go through the great tribulation. The sinful, visible church will go through the great tribulation. The worldly church, the church that has the world in it, the church that has Satan controlling it. The church that is just worshipping, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. The church that does not have the real new birth experience, called church, having a name that you live but is dead. The church, the Laodicean church, that says, I have need of nothing, and does not know that it is wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked, not having the garment of righteousness. The church that is visible, nominal, sinful, backsliding, apostate, that church, and that means the majority of the visible church, is going to miss the rapture, and is going to suffer during the great tribulation. So, we as children of God, and we as leaders in the church of the living God, oh, I praise God for you. Yours is a great, great responsibility. And the work that God has committed into your hand is greater than the work of university lecturer, greater than the work of an engineer, greater than the work of an historian, greater than the work of anybody on the face of the earth. Because, you see, all the work that anybody can do cannot make the people to escape the great tribulation. But, you know, you, as you are here, with the anointing of God upon you, with the calling of God upon your life, you are the person that God has said, my son, help me. I have some, some children in that village. I don't want them to go through the wrath, the indignation. 
I don't want them to go through the devastation, the desolation that Daniel spoke about. I do not want them to go through, to go through the veils that are poured out upon this world when the Antichrist will reign. And he says, my son, I give you the key. I give you the anointing. Help me in that village to preserve the small little flock that will not go through the great tribulation. And here is your great ministry. Your great ministry. Not to dance with the apostate church. Not to dance with the visible church. Not to compromise with the religious people of the land. There are religious people. They are not going anywhere. You are not just a religious person. You have a calling to select out a people for the almighty God. And get them ready. And tell them the angel is about to sound the trumpet. Get ready. Let us go. That's your responsibility. You cannot be like other pastors, other preachers of the, of the visible churches, of denominational churches, that they don't even know that the last days have come. They don't even know that the rapture is going to take place. They don't even know that now we're at the very edge, at the very brink of the call of God, when the trump of God shall sound. But God has called you that you will have such a ministry. I pray you will not fail in Jesus' name. Yes, you will not fail. God will help you. He's been helping you already. And you have been, he has been using you to get people saved, to get people sanctified, to get people separated from the world, to get people to be spotless and to be clean, to be part of the glorious church. We thank God for what God has done. But you know, since the rapture has not taken place yet, we still have some few minutes, some few hours, some few days, weeks, who knows, perhaps some few years, so that you will continue in that ministry and you will help in the work of the Lord. And your reward, you will not lose your reward. You see, we are available in the hands of God so that we can help and will be able to help the church, the little flock, they will not be too many because jesus christ himself said so he said many shall seek to enter i wish they entered but jesus said they will not be able because only few will be able to strive and they will be able to so discipline themselves and so crush themselves and be so crucified to the world that they will take the kingdom of God by violence. And he will say, come what may, whatever the price, whatever the cross, whatever the tears, whatever the self-denial, we're going through. And you go through that eye of the needle, you and Jesus alone. And then you go to the other side and we say, welcome, praise the Lord, you are able to make it. The people that are not willing to go through the eye of the needle, they are not going to make it. They are not going to make it. It's going to take cleansing, purifying. It's going to take the blood of Christ washing us, cleansing us, making us spotless, and making us to be part of the glorious church. Very, being very, very careful that we, not, we do not mix ourselves in doctrine, in life. In lifestyle, in anything that we do, we do not mix ourselves with the apostate, the fallen, the sinful, the worldly, visible church all around us. And then shall we ourselves be ready for the rapture. And then shall we be used of God to prepare others to be ready for the rapture in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In verse 51 behold i show you a mystery we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye and the last trump for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed and so we know that the rapture will take place as the saints that is, the spotless bride ascend in the air to meet the glorified Redeemer and King at the sound of the mighty trump of God as we gather up in the azure above. The marriage supper will take place in the heavens. That's in Revelation chapter 19, verses 6 to 9. Many things will happen during the marriage supper of the Lamb. I pray you will be there. It is there that Christ will be glorified in his saints. 
It is there that we'll have the judgment seat of Christ, where rewards will be given for faithful service. Every service that was done as unto the Lord, every service that was done in the Spirit, every service that was done for His glory alone will receive an unspeakable reward, and all other works will be burnt. Rewards will vary. Rewards will vary not according to the magnitude of the work I have done or the magnitude of the work you have done. Because you see, we have different responsibilities. And our responsibilities vary. And so our reward is not according to the size or the magnitude of the work we have done. Our reward will be according to our faithfulness in our little corner. The work appears small, but the faithfulness is perfect. The work appears to be just in a local place, local government area. But there is real faithfulness to God. The work appears not to be noticed by the people that are writing church history. But you, in your corner where you are, God has helped you to be faithful. Our reward will be not according to our fame, not according to our popularity, not according to our title in the church, but it will be according to our faithfulness unto the Lord. Be faithful. God knows every good thing you are doing. All who have suffered with Christ will also reign with him. Then shall we be united with our Lord and be with him forever. It is glorious to walk with Jesus here on earth. As Enoch walked with God, Christ's promise is that we shall be translated as Enoch was translated, without seeing death. That's the rapture. It will pay to be an overcomer, pay great, great dividends to be an overcomer and to meet the Lord in the air. Then shall we forever be with the Lord. Before I leave this section to go to the third point, we need to clear up the difference between the rapture of the saints and the revelation of Christ. What I mean is, you see many times we just hear preachers say, the second coming, the second coming, the second coming of Christ. And many of these preachers are not very clear as to the difference between the rapture and the second coming of Christ. Many times, they will read scriptures concerning the second coming of Christ, and they will think it concerns the rapture. Because of this, they do not know how to place the rapture in relationship, in time, with the great tribulation. And so you will hear many of them saying that, the rapture will be after the great tribulation. It is because they do not understand that as a study, eschatology, and the event of the last days, there is one, the rapture. There is two, the real second coming of Christ. Now, the difference is this. Number one, at the rapture, Christ will come into the air, not on the earth, into the air for his saints is coming for the saints at the second coming he will come to the earth not in the air and he will come with his saints and he will stand on the mount on mount olivet from which he ascended at the at the time of the rapture it's not going to be on mount olivet at the time of the rapture it's going to be in the air and then there will be that powerful supernatural magnet that will magnetize all the people that are real children of God, part of the church of the firstborn. And all of them are taken away. And they go to be with Christ. And then he goes to be with them at the marriage supper. And they, it will take place without any announcement. That is the rapture. But the revelation of Christ, which is the second coming, he will actually come and his feet will touch Mount Olivet. It will not be a private thing. It will not be a secret thing. Now, number two, 
the difference between the rapture and the second coming at the rapture. Christ comes for his bride, the church. At the second coming, he comes with his bride after the marriage supper of the Lamb to rule the nations. At the time of the rapture, he's not coming to rule the nations. At the time of the rapture, he's just coming to collect his bride. And when he takes his bride away, then you have the marriage supper of the Lamb. It is after that marriage supper of the Lamb, he will come with his bride that have been rewarded. And now to come, which is now the second coming, to rule over the nations. Number three, the rapture may occur at any moment. The second coming cannot occur until the Antichrist has had his day upon the earth. You see, the second coming will be preceded by the appearance of the Antichrist. And the second coming of Christ will be preceded by all those activities of the real Antichrist. Not the false prophets, not all that we see today. A real personality, the Antichrist. And until the Antichrist has had its day, the second coming will not take place. However, the rapture can take place any moment. That's the difference between the rapture and the second coming. Number four. The rapture is near the beginning of the great tribulation. Whereas the second coming is actually at the end of the great tribulation. The great tribulation is a period of seven years. At the beginning, just before the beginning of that great tribulation, you have the rapture. But it's at the end of the great tribulation that you actually have the second coming. Number five. The rapture will take place silently. So far as the world of sinners is concerned, it will happen quickly, without announcement. On the other hand, concerning the second coming, it will be witnessed by everyone. Behold, he cometh, and every eye shall see him, and they shall wail and lament because of him. And they will ask him, from where did you sustain this piercing, this injury? And they will say, in the house of my friends, referring to the Jews, the second coming will be something visible, something that will be known, something that every eye will see. But the rapture will take place quickly, without announcement, without notice, silently. Number six, the rapture is full of the sweetest comfort for the saints of God. But the second coming is full of solemnity and terror to them who obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. As the ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ, let us always, in everything we say and do, be looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. And let us endeavor by godly example and by scriptural preaching, prepare all our own church members, all the people under our influence for the rapture of the saints. Immediately after the rapture, something then will begin. This brings us to the third point, the great tribulation. The great tribulation after the rapture. In Daniel chapter 12, Verse 1. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Here Daniel tells the Jewish people that a time is coming. And that time will be, he calls it in that verse 1, a time of trouble. Oh, when you say a time of trouble, oh, you say that's all right, because Israel had known trouble since the time of 
Joseph. Israel had known trouble since the time of Moses. They were in the Egyptian kind of bondage. They saw trouble. In the wilderness, they saw trouble. In the wars in Canaan, they saw trouble. At the time of the judges, they saw trouble. Don't you see the, don't you hear the testimony of Gideon? Why have all these things befallen us? And in the time of King Saul, they saw trouble. In the time of David, with Goliath against them, with the Philistines against them, with all those Amalekites and Amorites and all those against them, they saw trouble. In the Babylonian captivity, oh yes, they saw trouble. But then, he says, not that kind of trouble. It is a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. That must be a terrible time. Anything greater than what they experienced in Egypt, greater than what they experienced under the Assyrians, greater than what they experienced in Babylon, greater than what they experienced before General Titus, greater than what they experienced in all their history, greater than what they experienced all this time, such as never was before since there was a nation. It must be a terrible time. Oh yes, that's the time of the Great Tribulation. Matthew chapter 24. Verses 21 and 22. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days shall be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, referring to Israel, for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. So that is talking about the great tribulation. In Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 6 and 7. Ask ye now, and see whether a man does travel with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins, as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness? Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved from it. When it says it shall be saved from it, the epistle to the Romans clears it up for us. It says a remnant of the children of Israel will be delivered. It's a time of real great suffering. Sephaniah. Sephaniah chapter 1. Verse 18. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy. For he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. That's the time of the great tribulation. At the moment the church triumphant is taken out of the earth, terrible darkness and sorrow will settle down in its terror upon this world, this earth. The whole world will be overtaken as in the days of the flood. During the great tribulation, awful things will take place on the earth. There will be a reign of terror, the fearful reign of the Antichrist, darkness, famine, torment, and slaughter. It will be a fearful thing for this world when even the dust of the dead saints is taken out of the earth. You realize what takes place at the rapture? That the dead who died in righteousness from the very first righteous man up until that time all of them their 
dead bodies are raised up, which means that the dust that went back to the dust, every bit of the dust of the dead saints, everything is taken away. And then the living saints, the children of God, everyone is taken away. The salt of the earth is gone. Even the dust of the dead saints that were salt at the time when they were living, everything is taken away. And when the very minutest bit of the dust of the saints of God have been completely removed from the earth, and the living saints have been evacuated, they have been taken away from the earth, then God has nothing that is, uh, that is peculiar to him, that is a treasure to him, that is favorite to him, why he will not pour out his wrath. It will be a time of wrath, a time of indignation, a time of judgment, a time of desolation, a time when there will be the fierce anger of the Almighty God combined with all the wickedness and the violence and the terror of the Antichrist and everything that will be taking place on earth at that time. I pray you will not be here at that time. God will send plagues as he did upon the land of Egypt only on a larger scale. Supernatural locusts coming out of the bottomless pit having power to afflict men's bodies will torment men on earth. These locusts, these locusts will sting like scorpions. People who are stung by the locusts will seek death and they shall not be permitted to die. So terrible will be the suffering of the great tribulation. You must not be here. Whatever you need to do to get ready for the rapture, whatever you need to do to be cleansed, to be made holy, to be sanctified, spotless, separated, waiting for the bridegroom, you ought to do because you must not be here at that time. It's a time when people want to cry and there's no tear. A time when they want to commit suicide and they will not die. A time when they want to run away from the fierce anger of him that seated upon the throne and there's nowhere to run to. A time when they will throw their gold and their silver, when they will throw their cosmetics and all the jewelry, when they will throw to bars, saying, take them, we don't want them. If we can just be relieved from the pain of the great tribulation, and the bats will throw them back, saying, we have no need of them. It's a time that men will try to run into the caves, to run, to run away and to flee and to hide from the indignation and the wrath and the anger of the God that rises up to judge the world. And then the caves will give way and say, face the judgment of what you have done. A terrible time. In Revelation, Revelation chapter 6, reading from verse 15, to verse 17 and the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and to the rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? In Revelation chapter 9, from verse 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw his star fall from heaven unto the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit, and he opened the bottomless pit. And there arose a smoke out of the pit. And the smoke of a, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, 
but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when it striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. And on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold. And their faces like, were like faces of men. And they had air as the air of women. And their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates. As it were, breastplates of iron. And their sound, the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle, and their tails like scorpions. And there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months, and they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue, has his name Apollyon. I pray you will not be there. <laughs> not only that, the Antichrist, that is the man of sin, will be revealed during the great tribulation after the bride of Christ has been taken out of the earth. That will be a time of untold suffering and trouble for the people of this earth. The Antichrist will be a king whose power is obtained from Satan. Not only that, at that time, the mark of the beast will be branded in the right hand or the forehead of those who live on the earth during the great tribulation. And those who do not have the mark cannot buy or sell. Consequently, it will mean starvation, torture, and suffering. Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. From verse 14, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles, the lying wonders, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by, by a sword, and did live, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as will not worship the image of the beast to be killed, shall be killed. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bound, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save except he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that has understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and the number is six hundred three score and six, six hundred and sixty six, 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 six. Now, what happens when somebody receives the mark of the beast? So that during the great tribulation, they'll be able to sell. He'll be able to buy, he'll be able to have some little, little things that may be available. Once he receives that mark of the beast, his doom is sealed forever. Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 and 10. And a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And it shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. The only thing is to be ready before that day. Because if one is not ready, nobody can tell. The great tribulation will cover a period of seven years. It will be a period of wrath, a time of trouble, a period of indignation, judgment, and desolation, a time of punishment. It will be a period of great suffering 
that no one will be able to endure. Those who miss the rapture will suffer the wrath and the indignation of the Antichrist. And the scripture description of the time is terrible. There's no time to read many of the references. You may want to write these down. Isaiah chapter 2. Just write down. We don't have time to read now. Isaiah chapter 2 verse 19. Isaiah chapter 24 verse 1 verse 3 verse 6. Isaiah 24 verses 1, 3, and 6. Isaiah chapter 26 verse 20 and verse 21. Isaiah chapter 26 verses 20 and 21. Joel chapter 2 verses 1 and 2. Joel chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Sephaniah chapter 1. Sephaniah chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Luke chapter 21, verses 25 and 26. Luke Chapter 21, verses 25 and 26. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3. Luke chapter 21, verse 36. Let's look at that last reference together. Luke chapter 21, verse 36. Watch ye therefore, and pray always, that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. Christ said, it is his desire that you will escape the great tribulation. It is his plan, if you will cooperate with him, that you will escape the great tribulation. Watch ye therefore, and pray always in your village where you are, after the congress, when your pastor is not around, when your local government area pastor is not around, when your region overseer is not there, when your state overseer is not there, when your national overseer is not there, don't become careless because your counselors, your leaders are not there. Watch and pray always in, in the time of temptation. At school where you go to school or where you are teaching. In the place of work where you are working. Anywhere you may find yourself among the people of your family. Where church members are not there with you. Watch and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape. All these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. How can we escape this terrible, special period of unbearable suffering? The way of escape, number one, is to have a definite experience of salvation. With daily, continual assurance of sonship. Number two, the way of escape. Is to be walking with God like Enoch walked with God. Walking by faith. Walking in the spirit and not walking in the flesh. Walking in obedience and not walking in rebellion. Number three, it is to obtain and maintain a pure heart. Because the Bible says, he that has this hope in him. The hope of going with Christ when he comes and reigning with Christ. Purifies himself even as Christ is pure. That you will walk in obedience, not in rebellion. You will maintain a pure heart. Having the mind of Christ. Being conformed to the image of Christ. Purified in your thoughts, in your motives, in your desires. As Christ is pure. Number four. It's to be watching and praying against the spirit of compromise. 
which will be common and which will pose a great, great danger in the last days. And these are those last days. Number five is to endure trial, endure persecution. However great those trials and persecution may be, knowing that they are not up to 1% of the great tribulation, is nothing to be compared. Whatever tears you have today, whatever suffering you have today, whatever affliction you have today, whatever need you have today, whatever oppression and injustice you have today, it is nothing to be compared with what people are going to go through through in the great tribulation. Endure this one and make the rapture rather than give up and then go and suffer greater trouble at the time of the great tribulation. Let us be wise. Then, above all, set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. Always looking up, always looking up, tuning your ear and your heart and your mind to the sound of the trumpet. Because one of these days, it may be that it is while you are preaching, it may be while you are preparing. It may be while you are sleeping. It may be while you are doing one thing or the other that a trumpet will sound suddenly. And because you are ready, you didn't sleep overnight, sleeping with anger, sleeping with malice, sleeping with an unforgiving spirit, saying, I just hate that thing, I hate that person, I don't like that pastor, I don't like our overseer. You don't have anything like that. Because you see, there are people that have hatred in their mind towards the people that are feeding them with the word of God. They say they don't like their overseer, they don't like their pastor, they don't like their teachers, they don't like those who are counseling them, they don't like this, they don't like that. And with that bitterness, with that malice, with that unforgiving spirit, they go to bed. And it was that night the, trump the trumpet was to sound. And what happens, brothers and sisters? Let's make sure that before we go to bed, anytime, we get ready and you are rapturable. Which means that you know that everything is settled. That should the Lord come, should the trumpet sound, before tomorrow morning, everything will be all right. What a wonderful thing it will be when the rapture will take place, when the Lord will call his own. And those of you from various regions and states and countries and some of our other brethren who are not here, there will be a great, great gathering when God will pick this one from that village from that town, from that locality, from that school, from that place of work, from that house, from everywhere, and we gather at the feet of Jesus. And then we meet together, and we see one another, and we'll never part again. This wonderful congress is coming to an end tomorrow. You see, every good meeting is going to break up here, you know, once in a while. We meet together like this, we enjoy wonderful fellowship. And eventually, in a few days, we just break up and go back again. But that will be a gathering where we will never part again. But then, make sure that you are looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. He is coming. Get 